Imagine you are one of the hundreds of people in New York, in Manhattan, who got your jury duty notice and are asked to assemble Monday morning at 10 a.m. in a courtroom where the jury in the case of the people versus Trump will be tried. After you take your seat in the jury pool, Judge Juan Mershon will describe the case summary in exactly these words. The defendant, Donald Trump, is charged with 34 counts of falsifying business records in the first degree. The allegations are in substance that Donald Trump falsified business records to conceal an agreement with others to unlawfully influence the 2016 presidential election. Specifically, it is alleged that Donald Trump made or caused false business records to hide the true nature of payments made to Michael Cohen by characterizing them as payment for legal services rendered pursuant to a retainer agreement. The people allege that, in fact, the payments were intended to reimburse Michael Cohen for money he paid to Stephanie Clifford, also known as Stormy Daniels, in the weeks before the presidential election to prevent her from publicly revealing details about a past sexual encounter with Donald Trump. And while you are sitting there in the jury pool, listening to the judge describe this case to you, Donald Trump is sitting at the defense table looking like this. Let's take that back down to a half screen of Donald Trump. Now, we normally don't allow Donald Trump to occupy your full television screen during this program. But for this one time, as you consider yourself sitting there on Monday in the position of a juror looking at him, let's look at what they will actually see without hearing a word from Donald Trump. And for that, we're going to go back to the full screen so you can take in what this man actually looks like now. Donald Trump is likely to be sitting there as he is in this recent campaign videos. That's a picture of him when he's trying to look his absolute best in his campaign video, which in his mind includes a face partially covered in some form of homemade bronzer in which he always forgets the ears. He always forgets his ears are visible, showing the real color of Donald Trump in contrast to the mud brown that he has decided makes him look his best. And to some eyes, actually makes him look like a horror movie character. That is not a face you want to present to a criminal jury whose job it is to concentrate on the evidence in the case. Those jurors will be listening to Judge Marchand's questions while having trouble fighting the urge to steal another peek at that profoundly strange looking man sitting at the defense table whose voice they will probably never hear in court. Because it is impossible, as Donald Trump and his lawyers know, for Donald Trump to testify under oath without committing perjury, perjury that he will not get away with. And Donald Trump will not be able to testify under oath and get away with trying to lie about what actually happened when he was alone in his hotel room with Stormy Daniels, who will testify under oath about what happened in that room. Donald Trump will not be able to get on the witness stand and successfully lie about his communications and conversations with Michael Cohen about paying off Stormy Daniels so that his presidential campaign could survive. And Michael Cohen will testify about that. And so with Donald Trump unable to testify in his own defense, the only thing he brings to his defense is that silent discolored face, a face that lies to you without Donald Trump saying a word, a face that claims to be a color of brown that is betrayed by his 77-year-old pink ears.
a face that is topped by hair, that is lying to you about exactly where Donald Trump's hairline might actually be. Every day that the jurors spend in that courtroom with defendant Trump, they will be wondering how he can be so deeply oblivious to the truth, the truth of what he looks like with that stuff that he slaps on his face. Some of them will be thinking correctly he can afford the best professional makeup, but this, this is what he chooses. They will be wondering about what other truths about himself is Donald Trump unable to admit. They will be wondering why he literally cannot look at himself in a mirror. That silent face will be the only way that Donald Trump, in effect, testifies to his first criminal jury. And what those jurors will see on that face every day in that courtroom is a lie. No matter how many days those jurors spend in that room with Donald Trump, they will never come to understand why he chooses to look like that. But they will easily be able to figure out why he paid Stormy Daniels. The evidence will show that he paid Stormy Daniels in order to be elected president. Many of the people in that jury pool will no doubt be afraid of Donald Trump because they have seen what his followers are willing to do for him on January 6th. In court, the jury selection process is referred to as a voir dire, French, meaning to see, to say. The court sees the potential jurors and hears what they say. When the potential jurors are asked simple questions like, what do you do for a living, and who is your current employer, or do you have any children? They could easily be reluctant to let Donald Trump hear the answers to those questions. The prospective jurors will all be asked what cable news networks they watch, what newspapers they read, if any, and what social media they use, if any. The New York Times has theorized that the prosecution will look favorably upon jurors who watch MSNBC or Stephen Colbert. And the defense will probably look favorably on potential jurors who watch the so-called Fox News Channel. All of the jurors will be asked, question 29, have you, a relative or a close friend, ever worked for any company or organization that is owned or run by Donald Trump or anyone in his family? Question 29A, have you, a relative or a close friend, ever worked or volunteered for a Trump presidential campaign, the Trump presidential administration, or any other political entity affiliated with Mr. Trump? Have you ever attended a rally or a campaign event for Donald Trump? Question 29B, have you ever attended a rally or campaign? Oh, there we go. That's redundant there. 29C, are you signed up for or have you ever been signed up for, subscribed to, or followed any newsletter or email listserv run by or on behalf of Mr. Trump or the Trump Organization? Question 29D, do you currently follow Donald Trump on any social media site or have you done so in the past? Question 29E, have you a relative or a close friend ever worked or volunteered for any anti-Trump group or organization? Question 29F, have you ever attended a rally or campaign event for any anti-Trump group or organization? Question 29G, are you signed up for or have you ever been signed up for, subscribed to or followed any newsletter or email list served run by or on behalf of any anti-Trump group or organization? Question 29H, do you currently follow any anti-Trump group or organization? on any social media site, or have you done so in the past? Question 30, have you ever considered yourself a supporter of or belonged to any of the following? The QAnon movement, Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, Three Percenters, Boogaloo Boys, Antifa. And question 31, do you have any strong opinions or firmly held beliefs about whether a former president may be criminally charged in state court? And the final question, each prospective juror will be asked to answer honestly is, is there any reason, whether it be a bias or something else, that would prevent you from being fair and impartial 
if you are selected as a juror in this case. Here is a flashback to the very first guest on the very first episode of this program 13 years ago. You and I had a mutual friend, Pat Moynihan. When Pat Moynihan, when you were running his show and I was his colleague, a majority in the Senate used to mean 51 votes. Since we've gotten elected, Barack Obama and Joe Biden, there's a new majority in the Senate, 60 votes. What the president's been able to do has been truly remarkable with the help of a Democratic Congress. And so those who don't get, didn't get everything they wanted, it's time to just buck up here, understand that we can make things better, continue to move forward, and but not yield the playing field to those folks who are against everything that we stand for in terms of the initiatives we put forward. You know, I, did, I didn't think of myself as running Pat Moynihan's show. Liz Moynihan ran Pat Moynihan's well, show, true. as you can remember. That's true. That could be Joe Biden's argument for re-election today. For those who didn't get everything they wanted, it's time to just buck up here, understand we can make things better, continue to move forward, but not yield the playing field to those folks who are against everything that we stand for. That is certainly what Pat Moynihan would be saying if he were still here to campaign for his dear friend, Joe Biden's reelection. Daniel Patrick Moynihan served 24 years in the Senate with Joe Biden before the Senate from his position as a tenured Harvard professor. Professor Moynihan went back and forth to government as first an assistant secretary of labor for President John F. Kennedy. Pat Moynihan continued to serve in the administration of President Lyndon Johnson after President Kennedy's assassination. In those days, it was common for presidents to appoint members of the opposite party uh, to some important positions, and so Pat Moynihan served as ambassador to India and ambassador to the United Nations in Republican administrations. The story of Pat Moynihan's life growing up, the son of a single mother who was a bartender while he was shining shoes in Times Square, to become a public policy visionary is told in the new PBS American Masters documentary titled simply Moynihan. Pat Moynihan wrote probably the first memo about global warming in the American government written in 1969. And that is part of how the Nixon presidency became so active on the environment. The Environmental Protection Agency was created during the Nixon presidency, thanks in part to Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Pat Moynihan's primary focus while working in the White House was on social policy, especially ways to improve the welfare system and change it into a program that could actually help lift people out of poverty. He's trying to get Johnson to understand this culture of poverty and racism that was assaulting the poor Negro family. The insight that he had was that we have to go beyond civil rights legislation to address the cumulative effects of chronic racial and economic subordination. And what he was saying was that we need to move beyond issues of liberty and address issues of equality. Johnson incorporates that thought into one of the most important addresses any president has ever given. But freedom is not enough. You do not take a person who for years has been hobbled by chains and liberate him, bringing up to the starting line of a race and then say, you are free to compete with all the others and still justly believe that you have been completely fair. This is the Thus, core of the liberal anthem that LBJ stood for. 
I remember listening very carefully to President Johnson's speech at Howard University in 1965, and I said, you know, this, this resonates with me. And it was based on the Moynihan Report. One of the reasons why Moynihan Report ended up blowing up in Moynihan's face is the document was never meant for public perusal. It is written in a very bombastic way. It, it was written to get the attention of politicians. Unless you took the time, and who does, to look into what Moynihan himself said were the causes, you would have taken up this view that these people just have to get their families together and everything will be fine. And that was what many in the black community believed they had to rebut. The advocacy for unequal preferential treatment, the advocacy for a minimum level of income for the family, the advocacy for a big jobs program. The kind of solutions Moynihan advocated for are, I would say, even in the time, were radical and are very, very radical now. You know, the Moynihan Report was the last point where you had a federal official making an argument, an implicit argument, for a massive investment in African-American communities, massive benevolent investment, and tying that case for investment to history. That is something that just really wouldn't happen today. The controversies that followed Professor Moynihan in and out of government did not diminish student interest in Professor Moynihan's courses when he returned to teaching. I was a freshman at Harvard in 67, and Pat Moynihan's course was well known because he was a brilliant man, but he had practical experience. When, Fris when Professor Moynihan was elected to the Senate, he worked his way up to the chairmanship of the Senate Finance Committee because he knew from his time working on welfare policy in the White House that the Senate Finance Committee actually controls not just taxation and international trade, but most of the important social policy of the federal government, including its biggest programs, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, unemployment insurance, and welfare. In the Senate, Pat Moynihan worked relentlessly to improve and strengthen all of those programs, knowing that they were crucial to the income security of millions of Americans. Senator Moynihan was viewed in the Senate with enormous respect, sometimes in comprehension, and sometimes a little fear. And the fear, of course, came from not wanting to go up against him in debate because he'd find something that you hadn't thought of and you'd be in trouble. Moynihan hated the notion that government is the problem. His own rejoinder to that was, if you have contempt for government, you will get contemptible government. There's no doubt in my mind that if Pat Moynihan had been airdropped into New England in the 1770s, he would have been one of the most prominent members of our founding fathers. One of my colleagues on the Republican side said, you know, you couldn't have a Senate of 100 Moynihans, but you sure need a Senate with one or two. What I learned from Senator Moynihan is commitment. I was there for just some of the more than 40 years he spent working on policies designed to strengthen the income security and improve the lives of people with the greatest economic struggles in this country. He spent decades trying to steer American foreign policy in more enlightened and helpful directions for this country and the world. And if you told him a project might take 30 years, then he'd say, well, then we'd better start now. And that's how long it took to complete the project now known as the glorious new Moynihan Train Hall at Penn Station in Manhattan. Senator Moynihan had the vision for that new train station 30 years ago. He went to work on it then, moving the federal government and state government and local government and Amtrak a bit closer to getting it done every year. Decades ago, decades before Moynihan Train Hall was completed, he had the architectural model of what you see there today in his office. He didn't live long enough to see that project completed or to ever see his name on that wall. But as with so many other things that he worked on, his commitment lives after him. 
Your guide through the PBS American Masters documentary Moynihan is the authoritative narration of recent Oscar nominee Jeffrey Wright. He rose to national celebrity as America's most famous representative to the United Nations. One word that's attached to you wherever you go until you're probably sick to death of it is flamboyant. The flamboyant Patrick Moynihan. Am I embarrassed to speak for a less than perfect democracy? Not one bit. Find me a better one. Moynihan is streaming on, P on the PBS website, uh, pbs.org, until April 26th and is also available on the Canopy streaming service. Go to pbs.org, click Shows, and click American Masters for Moynihan. Hey everyone, MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.